This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Should we start this thing? I guess. So today, I think we're going to be doing... We might put chapter 39 and 40 together. I don't know. Sometimes we say we do and then we don't, or the opposite. It depends a lot on, because like, we don't know how long we're going to go or how much material there is yeah. until it's done and until I edit it. Sometimes I just don't feel like editing the longer episodes. It's easy to throw out a sort of half an hour uh, shorter episode that's just a chapter simply because I have to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to edit a whole other chapter and throw that in there. Yeah. Um, and so it's easier to produce two a week if it's if it's a little shorter. We've got day jobs and stuff. <laughs> Speaking of which, I've mentioned this out loud on the podcast before that we're we have discussed possibly doing a totally separate non wheel of time related podcast and uh that has gained a little traction i got someone who i think seth will probably do some of the like editing and technical side stuff and um me and my friend tom might uh co-host a podcast about history that's why all I should probably say out loud yet, because everything else is still like we're bouncing ideas off of each other and trying to trying to figure out what would work. But and we'll like pick a, um, an event and have an angle on it or talk about it, like as far as maybe its relevance to the present day or, or something like that. But it should be really fun. I'll update when once we get somewhere. Probably I don't think we'll come out with anything until probably like December, January. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And and we want to try to get a few episodes recorded before we even so we can drop like a bunch at once yeah i'd, I'd be surprised if anything comes out this year yeah honestly. yeah yeah uh, under promise over deliver but yeah no i'm really excited about this i think i i know you've got a, a pretty sharp interest in history and yeah it'll be cool and if that does well we can it might turn into a, this could turn into a little umbrella thing yeah i mean why not we can think about other podcasts to make yeah all I need to do is quit my day job. Right, right. <laughs> that's what that's what that's what made me think of that. If only I didn't have to work, like I could come out with this stuff way faster. Donate to Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to help us out and really, you know, we're we're really happy doing this podcasting stuff. You know, we're finding a passion in it, um, and we'd love to do it more often. So, if you can help us get the word out, that would be amazing. Go ahead. Leave us a review on iTunes, or I guess it's the podcast app now. Yeah. If you listen to Watt Spoilers and you know people who like the Wheel of Time and listen to podcasts or might be interested, throw it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Go into recruiting mode. The more traction we can get, the more the more we can work on this. It's going to be a TV show. You're, go you're going to be the person who's going to tell your friends, read the books now, because you want to be the person who read them before the show came out. I think I have three friends that are into the wheel of time and i'm including john i've got four and i'm including the bartender that i just convinced to start reading <laughs> nice. it so and i know it's it's always hard to recommend something of this length but, uh, oh yeah yeah i feel like most people who are into the wheel of time also probably only know like two people right that are, how you know but if they tell two people and they tell two people we have <laughs> we have can, ourselves a pyramid scheme yeah <laughs> <laughs> But like, uh, like you know how the Black Aja have the little cells of, of three people? Yeah. That's basically what the Wheel of Time folks are, is like... Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> what are they called? Oh, We're know. like the little Black Aja scattered in the in the tower, and we, we have se secret signals. And we, yeah, we don't know who the other ones are when we're out in public. <laughs> the hearts, the Black Hearts. Oh, is that what they call them? Yeah. Oh, cool. Charlie is correcting me here. I Thanks, Charlie. Real-time follow-up. They're called the Black Hearts. Nice. So today we're doing chapter 39, which is called The Weaving of the Web, and our symbol is the Lion of Andor again. Do you have any theories about The Weaving of the Web as a chapter title and how that applies? Um, the last chapter was called Web of the Pattern. This one's called Weaving of the Web, and the next one is called The Web Titans. And I do have some theories on it. A uh, couple of points into my notes for this chapter, we see Fane like confront Rand in the street and he runs and doesn't know where he's going. He's just like sprinting through the streets and then he climbs up the wall to get, get a vantage and falls over because Elaine happens to talk behind him. And I just interpreted that as like there's this chaotic element 
that moves Rand and then the pattern puts Rand where he needs to be. I think there's a lot of random chance going on in this chapter. And whenever random chance is happening, that means it's time for the Taviran to sort of make their mark and, and pull everything together. Thus the weaving of the, the web. Weaving the weaving of the web. And, and all the characters are converging together. You know, you've got basically oh, yeah. all the main characters are entering Camelin for this moment. Yeah, this, this chapter is kind of short. In the next chapter, it's like an explosion of introductions. The super important characters. Elaine, Aguin, Galad, Morgase, Gareth Brine, Elida, um, Talonvor. Talonvor, all in that chapter. Yeah. Yeah, it's, but we'll get there. Uh, you know, we've seen the Two Rivers group of folks. Now yeah. we get introduced to the Camelin group of folks. And we'll yeah. get, you know, we get like the Kyrianans, we get the Aes Sedai, we get the Aiel, but we get introduced to each group individually. And this is the second big group of characters who come into the story. Yeah. Uh, but we start this chapter with Rand hanging out in the Queen's Blessing, watching the crowd stream by to head head towards the inner city to go see Loghain displayed in front of Morghese. It's a big event. Do they, do they just bring Loghain into the palace and Morghese sees him? Or is, does Morghese, like, I don't think we actually We don't see, see that scene, but I assume there's a, you know. Rand sees him go by. He never actually watches the, like, event event. No. He falls so, over. I assume Loghain goes in because at some point Elaine says, oh, mother will be busy doing the ceremony with Loghain. Yeah. And then the guy comes out and says, come see your mother right away. And she's like, oh, crap. Yeah, the ceremony should have happened there where he came into the palace. He was probably presented the, to the queen. She probably pronounced some sort of sentence upon him. Yeah. And then he was taken away. So that that would be my assumption of the the ceremony. Um, I think it's sort of a big deal here because the Andorran army had a big hand in in defeating Loghain's army. Right. Obviously, Aes Sedai were needed to defeat Loghain himself, but... But he had armies. Right. And later we find out that those armies may or may not have been getting information from the Red Aja. I operate under the opinion that Loghain's story about the Red Aja is entirely true from start to finish. I always felt inclined to believe it. I don't know that we ever see any evidence to prove or disprove, but come on, it's the Red Aja. Right. They're jerks. And I think they are heavily influenced by the Black Aja. You've got Galena. True. We do see later, is, aren't the, the Red Aja's, like, proportionally has more black in it than any of the others? Yes. Yeah. I'm, once once we get all the breakdown. See, we do see numbers at some point. From Varen's book. Mm-hmm. Way later, of course, but... Yeah. Because that's that is almost, I would say, one of the biggest spoilers of the entire series is that Varen's book that tells us who all at that point we get to know who all the Black Aja are. Yeah, it's like this big dump of information that changes everything about the previous books. Yeah, we get to find out Shirium was black. We get to find out. I mean, obviously, we learn Varen's black in that same scene. If we didn't already know, a sort of sort of double agent. Double agent. I, I think of her as a double double agent. Yeah. So, <laughs> a little derailed. We see Matt won't leave his room. We were talking about that in the last chapter. Yeah, whether it's depression, PTSD, or, Mashadar, you know, all of those sort of things coming together. We saw in the last chapter. Wait, the one we just released was the last chapter, right? No. 38, no? Because we've got two in the pipeline. <laughs> what are you confused about? <laughs> uh, no, no, I just uh, I sometimes forget what has been released and what I am just remembering us talking about. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, by the time this gets released, it'll be another two weeks out. I also <laughs> get them mixed up because, you know, it, it, you'd be surprised how hard it is to keep it straight uh, when you're you're reading two weeks ahead, but you're reading two weeks ahead, editing one week behind. Yeah, you've got it even worse. I'm yeah. I'm just like listen research record so i'm yeah so i'll often forget what happened in the previous chapter because i'll be so into two chapters ago because i'll have been editing what we were saying <laughs> um and then i'll be like wait what did we talk about in the last chapter because i experienced that but i didn't edit that yet so but in any case yeah. we saw matt throw himself into bed and we talked about how he doesn't leave for a while now and um Rand can't get him to get out of bed um, you know, and he talks about how it's kind of hard to find a healer these days. Herbalists and hedge doctors were la laying low in Camelin right now, 
There was talk against anyone who did any kind of healing or fortune-telling. Every night, the dragon's fang was scrawled on doors with a free hand, sometimes even in the daylight. So, you know, last time I was sort of talking about how I thought perhaps the Forsaken were stirring up the trouble. I had the thought it might more be the White Cloaks. They're definitely a part of it. Yeah. It's a big, difficult mire right now. Everybody's sort of angry at everybody. Yeah, with all these tensions. And the White Cloaks are definitely stirring it up. We also see, we see Master Gill telling Rand that this creepy beggar guy wearing rags is wandering around Camelot asking for the boys by name. And that's totally Fane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he must have some ability to home in on Rand, but he may not know exactly where he is if he's wandering around looking for him. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how. I think he could. He could. He can eventually find them. True. I guess if he knows direction. Generally. I think he can. Yeah. More yeah. or less, point to them. I just. I wonder why he doesn't walk right towards him. You know, they're in the same city. It doesn't seem that I'm unreasonable not sure. that he couldn't find him in the inn. They just got there. I suppose the more Rand moves around, the more difficult it becomes. And the next thing I have. It, as the Master Gill and Rand continue this conversation, is Master Gill telling Rand about these rumors of strange shapes moving around outside the walls of Camelon, which I thought is probably Trollocs and Fades, Shadow Spawn. That's what I wrote down too. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and, and even Rand mentions that they're probably Trollocs. Ah. Or Rand maybe it's kind. maybe Gil, I think maybe Master Gill like scoffs and is like, "What do they think it is? Trollocs?" And it's like, yeah. "Yeah, that's exactly what I think it is." He says the Shadow Man, <laughs> yeah. Loose Loose Theron Kinslayer himself, come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's there in front of yeah, him? Yeah, <laughs> his two guesses are maybe it's Trollocs, which it is. Or maybe it's the Kinslayer who's come back, who, which is the person he's talking to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, then he exaggerates. He said, like, the Shadow Man as opposed to um, a Shadow Man. I suppose, yeah. Which then, I guess is a fade. Right. But, he, you know, he's saying, like, um, this is like a boogeyman character to him. And then we I have a introduction to Lamguin, which is a character we see a bunch through the series. Yeah, he sort of uh, ends up glued to Morgay's when she runs from Gabriel. Yeah, and I th I think attached to Perrin for a little while because Morgay's and that whole group becomes part of Perrin's. Yeah, uh, basically royal house, royal entourage. Entourage. Yeah, I'm not really sure what the the right word for that, but while Elaine is taking the throne, Morgay's is hanging out with Perrin. She eventually becomes the liaison between the two. Yeah. Oh man, I love that scene later where it's Elaine and Perrin negotiating, right? Yeah. 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 Because she's she's pissed because she basically calls him a rebel. Yeah. And you know they don't have much of a personal relationship. They don't spend a lot of time like getting to know each other. Almost none. Yeah, I can't think of a time when they spend time together. I mm. guess there's maybe there's some time and tear in the stone. Um, that sounds right. That may be the only time. Yeah, but she's you know she's all kissing Rand and Perrin's you know doing his thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. They don't spend a lot of time together. They don't, and she's definitely angry because he's, in her eyes, leading a rebellion in Andor, and he doesn't really want to be king. So I think he eventually doesn't. He swears fealty to her, right? It's like a semi-autonomous nation state inside of Andor, basically. Right. That pays taxes to it, but yeah. They come. They come to some kind of agreement later. Yeah, but it's the the negotiation is uh, that's a pretty pretty good scene. Yeah, oh, it's a great scene. I like the description here. I guess I'll read it. Um, a bulky man, Master Gill had hired, stood at the head of the alley, leaning on a spear and watching the people run past with an apparent lack of interest. It was only apparent. Ran knew the fellow. His name was Lamgit Lamguin. Saw everything through those heavy lidded eyes, and for all his bullish look bulk, he could move like a cat. He also thought Queen Morgase was a light made flesh, or near enough. I had a thought about him, because Perrin does show up here later. Yeah. I'm surprised that Perrin doesn't recognize him... Later? Later, yeah, when he joins with Morgase. I mean, it's not that much time, but I, I think their interaction's really limited. It's just I had a thought that Perrin does come to the Queen's Blessing and does spend time there. He probably did meet him. Yeah. But then they do that whole you know, leaving through the ways thing. So that's a little traumatic. 
I can see where he may not remember <laughs> exactly. And then he shows up as part of like one of many refugees. That's true. At that point, Perrin's uh, sort of, I don't know what you would call him. I, a king, a leading a nation, yeah. Yeah. He's leading a nation on, on the run, so. Um, and Lan- Langin- Languin tells Rand to watch himself as he's leaving the end. He wants to go see Loghain. Some real-time follow-up. Someone says Perrin does recognize Languin and Master Gil, and he spends most of his time chatting with Master Gil. Oh, So he does cool. recognize them. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the follow-up. Yeah, I forgot yeah. all about that. Yeah, I don't remember that, but I, I believe you. And then, he, But he never figures out that it's more gays. Does he ever see more gays no, until No, probably then? not. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Only Gil and Lamguin, I think at that point, tell, tell him more. Mm. The people who are traveling with her know who she is, but yeah. nobody else does. Oh, you know, I think I do remember that scene. Like, Master Gil's, like, trying to kind of hide behind somebody. I really don't. Like, he moves out, and Perrin's like, oh, Master Gil. I do remember that scene now. It's like after the whole Amadisha thing. <laughs> Strand wanders through the streets and lets himself be pushed, pushed and pulled by the crowd. He's taking a bit of a risk going out there by himself with the red cloth yeah well he does say it's a little more calm because it's kind of a festival day people seem less worried about it he does note the tension and how there's way less red than white he says like one for every 10 and so people wearing red seem to be clumped together and for self-defense i have a couple of highlights as he walks through the city but not a ton a lot of descriptions of what the city looks like in the inner city I don't know. You probably don't really want to read that much of that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really have a lot about that. Just more great descriptions of the city and and this is Robert Jordan giving you some really great detail to sort of immerse you in the world and bring Camelin to life. But it's really beautiful. Yeah, there's not a lot to say about it. I do have one short highlight that I'll read. It's a couple sentences. Abruptly, he was swept around a bend. And this is Rand kind of being he has to walk where the crowd is going because right. the streets are so packed. And there was the palace. The streets even following the natural contours of the land, have been laid out laid out to spiral in on this. This Gleeman's tale of pale spires and golden domes and intricate stonework traceries, with the banner of Andor waving from every prominence, a centerpiece for which all, all the other vistas had been designed. Rand sees the Queen's guards aren't allowing anyone to get near the palace, even. I wrote there was some um, sort of snubbing of authority. They, they were sort of... The crowd was sort of getting away with uh, just sort of ignoring the, the people in charge. There's a scene where the the white cloaks are jostled. Yeah. And I think some guards get knocked around in the press. But, if you know, have you ever been in, like, a huge crowd like that? You you can – I feel like it, it all makes sense. And everyone has to kind of understand that you're not really in control of, like, which way you move anymore. I suppose that – yeah, it's more like a fluid almost. Yeah. Actually, I've seen crowd uh, movement modeled with fluid dynamics, um, <laughs> which is actually really uh, – there's a certain density at which people, once you're pressed up against people around you, you literally have no control over where you go. Yeah. And fluid dynamics starts to take hold over the mass of people. <laughs> That's weird. And it's why people die in – yeah, Black Friday in America every year. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it is. It's very easy to just basically yeah bas- get caught up in a wave and be crushed against a wall. Yeah. Holy crap. That's uh, it's crowd scary. I am not an outdoor person. Oh, I'm person not into yet. it either. <laughs> but Rand eventually fights his way to a pretty good spot. You know, he's, what, three people away from the front? So he thinks he's going he's gonna to be right near Loghain when he goes by. He's that annoying dude in the crowd that stands right in front of you. Who's like really tall. Who's 6'4". Yeah. <laughs> and stands right in the front. People are like mumbling behind him, he notes. But he doesn't care. Like he wants to see this. And he's, totally. he's, he's got his feet planted there. And then Rand noticed this like disturbance rippling through the crowd. Yeah. And we know that f- this is Fane walking through like I perceive as l- looking for Rand. But why- people have this really strong reaction to Fane. I wasn't sure how precise his tracking ability is. Maybe as he gets closer, it becomes more precise? Probably. That's that's what I'm assuming. I would think it's something like that. Yeah. And people have this really strong reaction to Fane, and I thought that was interesting. It's It's got to have something to do with Mashadar, because even if he's just like a filthy, smelly beggar, 
it doesn't make that much sense that people would be that disgusted or um, have that like strong of a reaction that the people seem to have to him. People are like getting out of his way and right. No, I, I think there's something going on there. There's yeah, just that he has not just a filthy. He, he there's something wrong with him. Yeah, and people are probably justifying that by saying, "Oh, he's a filthy, smelly beggar in their heads," but they're sensing something deeper. I think on some level they know, and he may be projecting something to get people out of his way too. That's true. You know, he doesn't always project that when he's like with the white cloaks or with Lyda. Although he may be less in control of his powers right now, because he has just gone through Shadar Logoth, and he spent this whole time running across the continent. So he's probably still in a in a state where the Fane influenced dark by the Dark One is still fighting the Mashadar influenced Mordeth. Um, when Master Gildas describes the rumors that he's heard of this beggar. That's asking for Rand and Matt by name. Maybe Perrin as well, hard to say. Everyone describes him as half mad. And the last time we saw a description of Fane, we saw someone describe him ar- constantly arguing with himself out loud. And that's what I perceive that as. It's right. the, the two separate halves. He's got these two personalities, Fane and Mordeth, fighting in his head. Yeah. Uh, one supported by the Dark One, the other supported by Mashadar. I have this description of him here as... Uh, Fane gets nearer to Rand. The ripple meandered through the crowd, drawing closer to the edge of the street as it came. No one seemed to hesitate in letting it go where it wanted, even if that meant losing a good spot for viewing as the crowd flowed back in on itself behind the passing. Finally, directly across from Rand, the crowd bulged into the street, pushing aside red-cloaked pikemen, who struggled to shove them back, but broke open. The stoop shape that shuffled hesitantly into the open looked more like a pile of filthy rags than a man. Rand heard murmurs of disgust around him. Rand knows that it's the beggar. So, and, and Rand doesn't n- recognize this as Fane. Yeah, later we, I have him say something like, for a moment I thought, and it just he just like trails mm-hmm. off. But, no, I guess it's right here. The ragged man paused on the far edge of the street. His cowl, torn and stiff with dirt, swung back and forth of his, as if searching for something or listening. Abruptly, he gave a wordless cry and flung out a dirty claw of a hand, pointing straight at Rand. Immediately, he began to scuttle across the street like a bug. And he knows it's the beggar. And for some reason, even Rand is terrified. He starts to run. You know, I think everyone is. He's worried about dark friends. He worries about... He thinks it's a dark friend after him. Pro- yeah. 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 He, I think that's what he says later. So, And when, when the hand points right at him, he's like, well, I know people are after me. I'm running. Yeah, it's one of those people. Yeah. And so he just takes off and runs randomly. There is a couple of things here. You could feel the beggar's eyes, like greasy water on his skin. He especially did not want the man close to him here, surrounded by people balanced on the brink of violence. Then when I read that, I was wondering how much of that is Mashadar and how much of that is like Rand's just general paranoia and fear. The greasy water on his skin makes me think that there may be a little bit of... Sounds like... Yeah. That sounds a lot like the Dark One's taint. Yeah. Um, It just made me wonder. It's not very clear, but... No, no. From Moraine, we know that the the taint of Mashadar can affect the people around him. And we know he has powers. So it doesn't surprise me that his gaze has a weird, oily feeling to it. Yeah. Especially on Rand. Because uh, Fane almost never lays, actually gets to lay eyes on Rand. The one time he cuts him with a dagger. Mm-hmm. But other than that, he uh, really never gets in contact with him again. Then I have Rand hurried, knowing the densely packed mass which he had to shove through and wiggle would give way before the filthy man. Shouts followed him, long legs eating paving stones, finally allows himself to collapse against the wall. The key thing in there is he runs randomly with no plan. Yeah. And any time that the story says a Taviran did something randomly, something important is about to happen. Right. So pay very ten- close attention to the next uh, couple of pages <laughs> is basically what that's saying. And that wall's not the wall, but he like stops there and pants and he's like, I better continue on and wanders around randomly with no idea where he's going until he like finds another good vantage point. 
at at some point he finds a few and but there's nobody wearing uh, nobody else wearing red there so he moves on so and he heads up and basically goes where no one really expects anyone to go which is climbing that garden wall yeah he sees a wall on top of a hilltop and suddenly has a thought yeah that's a good way to get get into the palace apparently yeah cuz uh doesn't matt use it later cuz he like remembers rand's story I like, think that's right. Yeah, and he totally like uses it to break into the palace. <laughs> and, um, and I think uh, like, uh, is it Talonvor? Somebody's like, oh, that darn garden wall. Uh, there's this little scene where Rand can like hear the trumpets and the drums and and stuff, and he's scrambling up this wall as quickly as he can. He kind of cuts his hands up, climbing fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he sits up there, and he basically gets a good good view of Loghain going by. Yeah. The last of the foot soldiers rounded the curve, and behind them was a massive wagon. Sixteen horses pulled it in hitches of four. In the center of its flat bed was a large cage of iron bars, and on each corner of the wagon bed sat two women, watching the cage as intently as if the procession and the crowd did not exist. Aes Sedai, he was certain. These are Aes Sedai watching. So that's eight Aes Sedai, right? Yeah. I, which I assume is six to hold the shield and two to... Hold him in flows of air? Make sh- Probably. Make sure he doesn't try anything. Yeah. Because we know that Loghain is dangerous anyway, in much the same way Rand is. Like when he, bef- I think before they put him in the box. No, it's when they take him out of the box and he sees Min. That's when he kills the warders. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kills, kills a couple of warders in that scene. Ca- right. Just casually. I can't wait for the box, as awful <laughs> as it is. That's such a cool part. And then do my wells right after. Uh, <laughs> I actually, yeah, that's about where I am in the audiobooks. I just finished uh, do my wells and started on uh, Path of Daggers. Oh, it's such a brutal part. Yeah. Is it? Oh, you just finished do my wells. Was is that? That's um. What book is that? That's Lord of Chaos. Lord of Chaos. I have a little description here. The false dragon was a tall man with long dark hair curling around, curling around his broad shoulders. He held himself upright. Rand thinks his clothes seem ordinary. Loghain was a king in every inch of him. The cage might as well not have been there. He held himself erect, head high, and looked over the crowd as if they had come down to do him honor. And we have it that when Loghain looks at a certain place, at a certain spot in the crowd, they all seem to quiet down. I guess he has this regal bearing. and He's somehow... He's intimidating. And he can still channel at this point. He's shielded, but he's not gentled. It makes me wonder... I mean, Aes Sedai or Aes Sedai, but it, it makes me wonder if the Aes Sedai are focusing on Loghain so intently because he's pushing. He's trying to channel. Possibly. They, I think they're just... Testing. Testing the yeah. shield all the time. That's. I sort of imagine him just slamming into it over and over just to... Just to because he can. Sure. <laughs> I assume they they're more worried about someone trying to break him free. Probably. I imagine that's why they bother to surround him with soldiers. The crowd howled at him, beyond words, a wave of sheer animal hate and fear, and Logan threw back his head and laughed as the palace swallowed him. I liked that. Do you know why he laughs? No, why? He sees Rand. Oh. Logan also has the ability to see Taviran. Wait, do they Oh shit. Oh, that's good. Is he, is he like? Don't they talk about that later? Yeah, Logain Logain mentions that he's he's talking to possibly Nynaeve when is she's he, trying to heal him. Is he is Logain actually laughing because he knows he that he sees the real dragon? Um, he definitely sees someone who's going to like tear the world apart. I think is what he says. But I'm guess I'm guessing he sees a Taviran. I don't think he knows it's the real dragon, but he sees someone. Loghain is the other person who has the talent for seeing Taviran. That's right. Suan. And Loghain. Loghain and Nicole. I think there's one other. Ni- Nicola? Nicola. I, always, I think of her as Nicole in my head. <laughs> but yeah, so but I, we forgot about Loghain. And Loghain actually looks up at the crowd and sees the most powerful Taviran he's ever seen sitting on the hill. Yeah. And he knows that it's going to just tear the world apart. And so he throws his head back and laughs. Oh, that's And too he describes good. that scene. I forgot all about that. I'm really glad he caught that. I really like looking at these scenes from the other character's perspective, especially when they go back and talk about it. Those, yeah. those are some of my favorite. Like when, uh, I think I've said this before, but when like Moraine goes back and talks about some of the early scenes at the end of the Eye of the World, 
they make me so happy because, because you get to see that scene again from her point of view. And the same thing in this scene where you get to see this scene again from Loghain's point of view. He describes it. Yeah. Super cool. Next thing I have is basically the close of the chapter. Should I just read through? Sure. No matter the cage, that had not been a defeated man. He shivered and rubbed his stinging hands on his thighs. Why were the eyes that I watching him? He wondered aloud. They're keeping him from touching the true source, silly. He jerked and looked up toward the girl's voice, and suddenly his precarious seat was gone. He had only time to realize that he was toppling backward, falling, when something struck his head, and a laughing Loghain chased him into spinning darkness. So that's Elaine and Gawain are sitting in the tree, yeah, right next to Rand as he. I'm imagining, up. yeah, directly behind him. All right, I imagine they're within, like, could have reached out and touched him, basically. That's how close they were. Yeah, and how appropriate that, like, as Loghain is laughing because he sees Rand as, like, one of the most powerful Tavaren ever, Rand falls into the palace garden and, like, uh, begins this uh, chain of events where he literally touches the lives of these very important people and... They're all part of his web now, his Tavaran pull. Let's talk about the people he's touched so far. I mean, he's touched Languin, he's touched Elaine, he's touched Gawain, he's touched, he will in the next chapter touch everyone who's in the palace. And when I say touch, I don't mean physically, I mean with his Tavaran yeah. uh, pulling. He just has to be near people, or it's I mean, he's, even. He's powerful enough, he really just has to be in the same city at one point. We were debating in one of the earlier episodes whether or not Loyal was pulled across the continent just just because of Rand. I think he is. Because, like, Varen talks about being stuck in a town in order to meet Matt. Oh, yeah. Is that the part where someone describes trying to leave a town and not being able to? She, every time she tries to make a gateway, she gets, like, interrupted and has to, like, move. <laughs> um, yeah. No, she's, yeah. She, like... Varen spent, like, a couple of months studying the Tavirinness of, like, being stuck in one town. Think of Varen to make the best out of a terrible situation. Because she puts out flyers looking for Matt and Perrin. And, like, there's a whole scene where, like, Perrin thinks there's dark friends looking for him. Oh, that's right. I forgot about It's actually Varen. Who knows? He's in the... She's like, she deduces one of those two must be in the area because she can't leave the town. You can't pick up that bucket. Oh, never mind. He really likes that bucket. <laughs> it's so freaking loud. <laughs> he thinks it's a great toy. You know, you buy him all the nice toys, and he, like, ignores them for the bucket. Just like children. You buy fancy stuff for babies, and then they play with the TV remote. <laughs> <laughs> or your phone. Yeah. He's just throwing a bucket around the basement. <laughs> One of the followers on Instagram was kind of joking about bringing the bowl of winds to Houston. I told her I'd talk to the wind finders, but she better be prepared to strike a hard bargain. Nice. Yeah, with all the natural disasters going on, it does sometimes feel a little bit like the Dark One's touch is on the world. Yeah. Was that? Because I woke up at like 2 a.m. and saw it. Timber woke me up at 2 a.m. Oh. I was uh, hanging out with someone randomly. A little sleepover. Nice. Yeah. Sam somebody? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It was totally, totally random. This um, girl I know, she's a, like a mutual friend, and we've been hanging out like just in groups a lot. And she's uh, like, I always see her like at the bar with everyone. And she's um, has a, was going to move in with one of her friends and her friend flaked out and now like isn't going to move into this new place and I was just like well hey man like I have this extra room in my apartment if you want to rent it um you know you can come look at it sometime like especially if you're just want to like rent it for a couple of months and save myself you know good amount good chunk of money if she splits rent with me for yeah two three months or whatever while she's finding a new place 
And then, of course, she came over to look at it, and we like drank some beers and hung out. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, I envy the single life that Patrick leads. So I don't know if that's weird now, if she moves in. I don't fucking know. I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> with my life. <laughs> I just do things. <laughs> Opportunities present themselves, and I just take it. I've done that with you around. I'm not nearly as good at it as you are. <laughs> I much prefer the uh, the dating life to the single life. Uh, yeah, I think I just put myself in those situations a lot more. It helps that you work in a restaurant where girls leave their number on your table, too. That's true. That yeah, yeah. my longest relationship ever happened because a girl left her phone number on a table, and I called it. It's because you meet hundreds of people a day. It's true. Yeah, it increases chances definitely. But so you got a tattoo today? Oh yeah. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is my tattoo artist. By the way, uh, I feel like I should just, uh, what do you call this, a shout out? Go to Elizabeth a Robinson plug? Tattoo, a plug. Elizabeth Robinson Tattoo on Instagram and like her shit and go get tattoos from her. Make her famous. <laughs> she's already moderately, she's like, when I first started going to her, she's, um, I could like just pick a day and she would like have an, uh, find an opening. And now I have to schedule like a couple months out. I'd say the tattoos she's been doing on you are my favorite of your tattoos. Thanks. Yeah, I think they're the best. They're really good. She's really good. Um, I don't know if how much is on Instagram or we've talked about it. I've a, a work, been working on a sleeve of wild edible plants. So I have like a red clover, a sprouting acorn, a dandelion, blackberry. I just got a branch of blueberries today. Are they native Oregon plants? Uh. No, I mean dandelions, an invasive species. I right. don't know how many people know that. But the other one, the other ones are. I'm going to get bigger stuff up top, and I think I'm yeah. going to start putting some insects in. I'm gonna oh, get, okay. uh, I've always kind of wanted the spiderweb elbow tattoo, but I was I was like, I don't know. Like I'm not into like the traditional style, really. I like the idea, but not the... But I think I'm going to do it now. It's just going to be a realistic spiderweb on gonna the say, plants. I was going to say, much more arm. organic yeah. would work really well. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a that's gonna be a good arm. Do you have any ideas what you want to do with the other one? Uh, up top next, I'm gonna do uh like a maple branch like on the shoulder area because I'm getting past the the blueberries went through the um Elizabeth called called it the ditch. She was like, "This is a right." I always think of this as a rite of passage when people get their ditch tattooed. <laughs> it's a, the in, it's a the like inside the el of your elbow elbow pit. Yeah, yeah. As you, I can see it because you're pointing at it. Oh yeah, right. No, not that they can't. When she was like going back over stuff at the end, I was like, I was doing the whole like I took went up to the front desk and took a bunch of dum dums and I was like sucking on them to distract myself and biting down on the stick and like hoping it wasn't too obvious. And it's not even that big of a tattoo. It's like maybe the size of my hand, which is an average man's hand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because it goes from the elbow pit to like up to my armpit. Okay, it's kind of like in a straight fine like that so that was fleshy that's like tender in here too is it going to be pretty swollen for a while uh no the the out, outlines because i'm just i just have black and white outlines mostly right now um the outlines heal pretty quick and they require a lot less maintenance it's when you get like a whole canvas done mm -hmm. like when you get the outlines and then they go over it with color that it really like shreds up the skin and it needs help healing are you going back to color at some point? I'm not sure. I think I might. We were talking about it a little today. I think what I'll probably do is end up asking for a, a lot of really subtle color because Elizabeth's style is it's like really detailed. There's like a lot of very small lines to you can see. I don't I guess I could like post a picture. Maybe we'll throw one in the show notes. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Um. But there's, th yeah, there's just a lot of fine detail in it with the, just the black lines, black line work. So, sh and she was like, so if we like were to do dark green leaves, she was like, all the fine detail is going to be like washed mm -hmm. out. You won't be able to really see it. I was well, like, and the oh, detail yeah. already makes it pretty dark. Having that much ink to and that much detail in there brings brings the color down. So I could see where like just a little bit of subtle shading, maybe at the base, yeah, would add a lot. I think maybe just a like watercolor almost, right? Not like realistic. And that's basically what the tattoos are. They're like diagram-like representations of a plant. Something like you'd see in a botany book. Exactly. Yeah. Some 
some of them are literally taken from botany books. Oh, okay. Hey, <laughs> a couple of then them. Then that was a good call on my yeah. part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're in the Portland area, go um, make an appointment with Elizabeth Robinson at The Hive in Kenton. She's the shit. I've been enjoying watching that whole sleeve come together. I wasn't scheduled today. She had um, someone cancel an appointment. So I I randomly went in at 1 o'clock and just started a tattoo. She called me like yesterday morning. I was just like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure like it won't be that big of a tattoo, so I should be able to go right from there to the recording. Yeah. And that's what I did. Cool. So, yeah, you, you just finished up like half an hour ago. Yeah. It's itchy and weird and taped up. Finally got some rain up in Portland, and maybe uh, fires aren't as bad. I haven't actually read the news. Have you? Um, I haven't checked up on them, but I assume that they pretty much stopped the spread. Yeah. And that maybe they're not out yet, and there's still some in-burning that's going to happen. Kind of maintained now. Yeah. That's what I was reading it would do, so I haven't actually checked to make sure it did do that. But it's been raining pretty heavily, so I imagine if it was going to have any effect... Yeah, it was pretty nuts the last couple of days. Yeah. Temperatures come down too, so I, this is this is my kind of weather. I like it. I go out and just stand in the rain some days. Kind of reminds me of the weeping from uh, Brandon Sanderson. The where the the storm that rolls around the world. There's the the high storms, and they're the big intense ones. Yeah, and they come every couple of days, but once a year, or is it twice a year? There's a period of like forty days where it just rains gently the entire time. And there's no high storms. Nah, I kind of only vaguely remember. The weeping sort of reminds me of like a Portland winter. Yeah, except it's longer. I've been really enjoying this imperfect produce delivery I've been getting. Oh yeah, Seth just gave me this uh, like coupon code thing. I think I might do it too. This really is something that we should get paid to say. You know, you've heard here Blue Apron on all the podcasts, uh, and that's a food delivery thing. But this is this is cool. It's uh, the one thing I did the Blue Apron for a little while, and it was just full of so much packaging. I felt like I was throwing away like three times oh, yeah. as much stuff as I would have been to to make the same meal. That was when we rented the big house on Clinton Street. Yeah, and I did that for a little while, and I liked it. It was nice to be able to make those meals, but yeah, it's just way too much packaging and a little little expensive. What's it called? Ugly In, produce? Uh, imperfect produce. Imperfect produce. Yeah. And they, they basically go to grocery stores and they go through the produce that they're going to throw out that's perfectly fine, but maybe has a blemish or isn't the right size or isn't the right shape. Yeah. And they package that up in a box and, and ship it to you once a week. And it's a really cheap way to get some high quality fresh produce and they're just, just like looks apples that aren't perfectly heart shaped and like hail scars you don't actually see this very much unless i think feel like you go to like farmers markets or because you don't really see it in supermarkets yeah they, they they filter like just the fact that a tomato touched the ground and has like a slightly opaque you know brown spot on it where it was touching the ground you know that doesn't change yeah. the quality of the tomato and if you've ever grown fruit you know you know that happens and it's still really good and frankly, they're dropping it off at my front door. And that saves me a lot of time and effort going to the grocery store. And it drives whatever I cook for that night because I'm like, oh, I have all these veggies. So instead of munching on chips, I munch on celery or carrots or... That's kind of why I'm into it. Because I, I feel like you could just like make rice and stir fry basically anything <laughs> and throw it in there, you know? And that's a lot of what I do anyway. Yeah. I'm just cooking for myself. I just make something basic. And like you can you can keep your staples on hand, your rice, your beans, you know, those those can be mm -hmm. on hand and then you get a weekly delivery of veggies and you just you can throw together a rice bean and veggie meal and man, you can live off that forever. Yeah. They didn't pay me to say that, but they should. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough? As long as that bucket nonsense is finished.